public engagement through four different surveys. One uh, publicly posted on the Let's Talk Richmond site for parents. That survey is available in both English and simplified Chinese uh, and has been widely circulated uh, within the city by the school district uh, and by a number of other community organizations. We're also doing a, an employer and post-secondary institution survey to capture some of the perspectives of large employers in Richmond, a survey for community partners, and a survey for childcare operators. We're also doing a number of focus groups with city staff, school district staff, um, and then other service providers targeting specific demographic groups. Uh, for example, we met with the service providers who deliver supports to young parents in Richmond and gathered their uh, perspectives and priorities for childcare for that particular population. Public consultation for that project will continue until October the 25th, and a report will be uh, developed and back out to, uh, to council and then to the public early in 2021. Are there any questions on that uh, perspective? Okay, moving on to our future city-owned childcare facilities. We have three facilities currently in development. The Seedlings Early Childhood Development Hub at number three road and Cook, right by the Brighouse Skytrain station. Richmond Society for Community Living will be the operator of that facility. Sprouts Early Childhood Development Hub is located across the street from the location of the, the future Capstan Village Skytrain Station, and the YMCA will be the operator of that facility. And Hummingbird Child Care Facility on uh, Pearson Way is also in development. Again, the YMCA will be the operator for that facility. And all three projects have recently received uh, provincial funding under the Child Care BC New Spaces Grant in order to provide furnishings and equipment for those facilities that are not provided by the developer. So we were very pleased to see those three uh, projects announced for funding, as well as the one that the school district received for Thompson Elementary School. Do we have any questions for Ms. Duggan? Moving on to the last update, we're also beginning our annual update to the child care needs assessment and strategy. Uh, and that will outline the typical progress on actions within the strategy that have been undertaken in 2020. But that will also uh, include um, a, a fairly detailed overview of some of the impacts that we've seen on the child care six sector from the COVID-19 pandemic. So that report will uh, be available probably in early 2021 um, and will be capturing both the actions that the city has taken, but also uh, a summary of the impact of the pandemic on the childcare landscape in Richmond. Okay. Do you have any Thanks. questions? I actually have a couple questions for you, uh, Chris. Um, I know maybe this is a little bit outside of it. So are we following anything that's happening with the preschools, the registered preschools and that kind of enrollment? The preschools for them through the chair, the preschools mostly closed uh, after spring break of last year. Uh, we are hearing that many have reopened. Anecdotally, we've heard that a, a lot of the preschools do have low enrollment as well. And our child care inventory that we will be doing in November will capture some of that data as well. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that we have received some grants and things for that, like, Avenue program that was helping for families who are um, maybe, you know, trying to develop their children a little bit. Um, and some early learning, there's development targets for kids. And so if kids aren't going to daycare, they're not going to these preschool activities and stuff, um, you know, is this a red flag for something else in our, in our community? Uh, through the chair, there have been a number of community organizations that have been delivering some programming uh, virtually throughout the pandemic, Richmond Family Place uh, and the Richmond Public Library being, being two of them. Those organizations are continuing to deliver 
virtual programming and support to families, but are also starting to begin in-person programming. And I also uh, understand that the Strong Start programs within the school district are also reopening, I believe it's next week, uh, for in-person, face-to-face uh, opportunities to visit those programs as well. So I, I think that, yes, potentially there are some developmental um, worries that the community has about those children who aren't having face-to-face -face opportunities to engage in early learning programs. But the community organizations have done a very good job of continuing to provide some kinds of stimulation and support to families uh, throughout the pandemic and hopefully we'll see increased ability to deliver some face-to-face -face programming uh, as well. And then perhaps uh, Ms. Ayers has some additional information with regards to the city run, or uh, the community association run preschool programs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, to the chair, I would like to note that uh, all of the preschools that the community associations operate in partnership with the city have reopened and started uh, as of the middle of September. Uh, we did see some people withdraw from registration, so we're sitting at about 60 to 65 percent of our capacity, but all of them are up and operating, and uh, uh, the children that are coming are having really great experiences. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else have a question? I can't see everyone on, so you have to just speak up if, you, if you've got one. Okay, can I have a motion to receive this for information? So move, Ken. Second, Sandra, okay. thank you. All in favor? That's passed. Okay, next item, Poverty Reduction and Prevention Action Plan. Hi, it's Heather Meter again. Thank you. Okay. I'm happy to report the city received a 25,000 grant also from the Union of BC Municipalities to develop an action plan to reduce and prevent poverty enrichment. So the project's primary goals are to identify areas of greatest community need for low-income individuals, specifically living in the Blundell, Broadmoor, City Centre and Thompson planning areas, and to develop an action plan to improve access to services and increase social inclusion in those areas. The identified planning areas have the highest percentage of persons living with low income. So Blundell at 24%, Broadmoor at 22%, City Centre at 32%, and Thompson at 25%, based on the after-tax low income measure. These areas are also the highest percentage of persons living in low income based on demographics by area. For example, low parent households and seniors. The city, in collaboration with other agencies and individuals with lived experience, will identify vulnerability indicators to be used to monitor progress as part of the action plan. There will be short, medium, and long-term goals over 10 years. And the project will combine income-based data and data from vulnerability indicators, such as housing affordability, with qualitative data from persons with lived experience and community organizations to form a more comprehensive understanding of the challenges facing low-income residents in this area, in these areas. Uh, the Richmond School District is represented on the project steering committee with Larry Antrim, and city staff will reach out to school teams, including Swiss workers from those planning areas as part of a more targeted engagement. So it's still early in the project. Uh, the engagement timeline, timelines are still being determined with the project completion target date of May, 2021. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, move receipt. Second. And Second. Happy. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. And the, number five, we have the bicycle pump track. I think Alex, or some, Alex is going to give us that. Good morning, everybody. Um, if before I begin, I, I would like to uh, just double check that I'm not speaking too loudly or that everybody can hear me. All right. Yep. yep. Okay, great. I'm just going to set up the uh, 
the PowerPoint presentation. You can actually turn it up a short presentation to uh, give you this morning about uh, a pump track that um, Parks has proposed and was approved by Council uh, in 2020. And we just closed on a RFP uh, to which, uh, much to our um, satisfaction and, and, you know, we were quite pleased that Hoots uh, Limited, who built our uh, our pump track at Garden City Park uh, a few years ago, uh, was the winning bid on this new pump track. And um, uh, everybody can see the PowerPoint? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll begin and uh, we'll proceed. So yeah, once again, my name is Alex Kanitsky. Uh, I'm a park planner, uh, and and I have the privilege of working with with the team over at Park Services. Uh, Todd Gross, my uh, director, is on the line, and I believe uh, Jason Chan, my manager, is as well. So both, uh, all three of us, are available. Should you have any questions this morning or to follow up uh, later on, and um, uh, let me hit enter. Come on, oh, here, just bear with me, please. Um, next. Okay, there we go. So um, we have uh, the overall context of, of the site is uh, the, the, the site is where the star is located at the corner of Granville and Railway Avenue over in the Thompson neighborhood. And it's along uh, uh, the, uh, one of the key points along the railway greenway that, of course, stretches from uh, the uh, West Dyke Trail on the north arm all the way down to Steveston. And um, the, the, the location of this um, future bike skills park is, is key because uh, w people will be able to travel and, and presumably <laughs> ride their bikes. Uh, to to the skills park along uh, the railway greenway, and they could do so safely off street. Um, the the other key factor to locating this site, besides it being a, a, a relatively large open uh, area that was available from the pit, uh, is is that it's quite close to three uh, community facilities, two of which, of course, are schools. And, and one is uh, Thompson Community Center. And then there's a parkour park and, and outdoor facilities at Thompson. And of course, basketball courts and sports fields in and around the schools. So this, this is a real hub for outdoor activity and physical um, uh, development of, of youth. And frankly, uh, even uh, some 48 year old park planners. Um, uh, the, the, other uh, recreational and, and park facilities in the area include those that I've highlighted. Uh, Minaru, of course, it, near uh, Gilbert, uh, Garden City Park, and I highlight that once again because of the skills park. And then, and the intention is to have a real relationship with Garden City Park, which I'll speak to in a moment. And then uh, Richmond Olympic Oval on the north, which is very easy to get to, probably a five, yeah, 10, 15 minute bike ride from this site up to the railway greenway and then uh, along the dike trail to the oval. And then of course, um, skateboard park. The skateboard park is, is obviously for skateboarders, but there's also folks using uh, the, the, the park for uh, BMXing. And then this site would be the same. And, and really, um, I would say that uh, the skateboard park and, and Garden City Park are, are very popular, like especially nowadays, I've driven by Garden City Park or ridden in uh, to and from uh, work uh, along uh, Garden City uh, Road. And I've seen the Garden City Park uh, terrain park is quite busy, very busy. So the, the, the timing of the construction or planned construction for this skills park is important. And, and we are, our intention is that this skills park will be um, a, a, 
a, a very um, I I introductory, like a green and blue level uh, skills development and, and, and obstacles. And then we would move towards um, something along the lines of, of, of people developing their skills here and then saying, okay, you've, you've perfected all the, the obstacles here. You can move on to the Garden City Park or the skateboard park along River Road. Of course, we're, you know, there's not going to be a pass fail or any report card or anything like that. It's, it's, it's obviously relying on people's own comfort level and, and being like, oh, okay, I think I've mastered all this and, you know, this is kind of getting boring. I think I'm going to try for something more challenging and, and that hopefully uh, they can find that challenge at either the skateboard park or more uh, specifically at the terrain park at Garden City Park. Um, the, the idea is that we, we, we build uh, skills that are informed by the community and specifically the bike community. And um, so we're, we're looking for uh, input from uh, your uh, students at the various schools as well as the, the bike um, community that is, you know, in the teenage, uh, adolescent, teenage years, early 20s, and that, that they could probably really help us out with, with developing what kind of obstacles we should have. Now, Hoots is, by all means, uh, very much tuned into that. They've built any number, like tens, and if not uh, almost a hundred uh, sites uh, throughout Western Canada, all the way out to Ontario. So they're very good at what they do. And, and um, they have, have developed like this one here on the, on the screen. Uh, recently in Moodyville in, in North Vancouver, uh, they actually made a pavement uh, one. So it's very durable. And this is something we might consider uh, for Garden City Park in terms of longevity, but not necessarily. We have the materials and we certainly are contemplating building something using natural materials, uh, brown clay, uh, stone, uh, boulders, and... and um, logs and as well as dimensional number. Um, but, uh, you know, we may, through the design process, feel that with this, this might be the right approach in terms of long-term maintenance and, and, and uh, basically just being able to use the entire space uh, all the time, no matter what the weather is. Um, be that as it may, uh, we, we would like to uh, have input from, uh, from the, the community and, and we're looking to identify stakeholders. So if anybody here on the call uh, from uh, either the city or councillors or the trustees have, uh, have contacts that, um, and groups that we you feel that we should be uh, working with, uh, we would certainly love to, to do that. And, and our timing is, is that basically we're going to engage with Hoots uh, you know, later on this fall and then uh, do what's called design development. So uh, get input from the community in, in, in early 2021, and then uh, kind of retreat back to the office, if you will, and, and, and work with Hoots on, on you know, uh, engineering that and designing that and trying to make sure that we can evaluate what we've had input on and then what can we actually build, what can we afford, what we have space for, and then go back to the community uh, for feedback on, on perhaps one or two options that we've created. And then, of course, uh, constructing it in the spring and then having the community attend a grand opening. You know, this is all a very rough timeline, but we're thinking in the summer 2021. And then, of course, we hope they ride it uh, a lot and enjoy it because they have that input on it. So, um, that concludes my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, I'm available now, of course, or uh, you can email me at the uh, address. I have a question. Yes, Councillor. Uh, thank you. Um, if you go back a slide, the Hoots provided image looks um, very not natural. And you had spoken earlier about having a natural. Um, 
uh, track. So we're not getting asphalt, right? We're getting natural materials. Uh, yeah, the, so so we have, uh, we, it, it, it was our intention, and we we have the material to build a natural uh, bike park such as what they have at the terrain park, and and frankly, what is traditionally otherwise built um, in uh, uh, most bike parks are naturally built. Um, they, the city of North Vancouver, and in, in, in with Hoots. Uh, they 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 developed this park in Moodyville in North Vancouver. It is an option. It may not be the option we we will do in in um, in 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 Richmond. So we may. Uh, but I'm just. I guess I was providing this image as, hey, this is something different. It, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's something you know. Yeah, you can see these options here, and of course, what we see at um, Garden City Park is works really well and 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 certainly uh there is a feel to it when you're riding on asphalt versus dirt uh mm -hmm. that, that yes natural material is certainly what i'm inclined uh, mm -hmm. but then again as park planners and designers uh we really want to enter into a design process with an open mind and see what the community has and then balance that with long-term uh, maintenance costs, uh, safety, um, uh, the feel and uh, what the costs and, and what materials we have available. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the natural ones for me, I think, <clears throat> is definitely a preference. Um, it's better for the mental health to be in, in a natural environment. Um, and um, uh, I don't know if you've looked at... Um, tracks elsewhere, but the one at um, uh, Alice Lake uh, Provincial Park campground um, is really, really great for younger um, riders, but also um, challenging enough to kind of keep, you know, middle school kids interested. Um, so that might be something that's all natural. It's built right into the forest. Um, so anyway, thank you. Question? Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, uh, you mentioned safety, and I guess that's where my mind is going with this proposal. Um, and I know that, of course, that'll be part of the consultation and the considerations, but uh, living very close to that, that intersection there, um, I'm really conscious that already uh, the bike, uh, the walking and bike trail there it's an, an awful lot of use and normally it's when I see young, I'm a, if this is a beginner level kind of prod, uh, kind of area, I would imagine it will be attracting younger, uh, younger riders. Um, as you say, it's very close to Blair and McKay and within easy biking distance of a number of our other elementary schools. Uh, it's a really busy intersection. It's, and you're right in the, this is that area right in the middle as you cross over from Burnett onto the trail, um, already that that crosswalk is under heavy use, and drivers have to be really aware. But I, um, there's also two entrances to uh, school, uh, Burnett School parking lots right there. It's uh, at certain times, especially, it's extremely busy. Um, people pulling in and out of there. Um, and bike and cyclists and pedestrians trying to cross there. And I, it, it occurs to me, it would be concerning if, if younger children, elementary school age children, especially were, were making their own way there because it's now there's like, it's a destination. Um, normally I see them with, in a family context with parents cycling and walking, but it might, if they're gonna be, you know, venturing there more often on their own to play, um, that, that that's gonna be a, that location is, is uh, dicey. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's certainly part of uh, the analysis, uh, the site analysis and design consideration for the site. And uh, uh, we'll definitely be working with our colleagues in transportation. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Hamaguchi. I'll, uh, I think it's a great project and looking forward to it uh, coming to fruition. Just a question. Um, it's obviously geared at the kids with a more basic skill level. 
In terms of an age range, uh, and you might have covered this, but is there a, um, does that uh, what age range would that basically cover? Uh, are you looking? Are you expecting? Yeah, through the chair to the uh, trustee. Um, generally speaking, uh, this would be uh, the age range of, of children we'd be looking at, as as represented in the images on the right hand side. We would imagine, uh, and you know, frankly, as a father of four, I would expect uh, that parents uh, would be there uh, with them to uh, to guide them. Um, so run a bikes and and uh, introductory level pedal bikes and and then young uh, kids on on you know kind of uh, uh, 15 14 15 inch um, uh, front suspension bikes if, if if kids are there with fully suspended bikes I would argue that uh, perhaps they uh, may uh, use this once or twice and then move on to the Garden City Park but frankly um, Speaking for myself, uh, I'm, I'm a rider uh, almost 30 years uh, because I'm old. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm 30 years, and and um, it, you know uh, that's mostly riding on on road and commuting. Um, but even even I get enjoyment out of, of challenging myself on some of these smaller. Um, skills and, and obstacles. Uh, once these are mastered, and, 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 and of course I'm the exception in terms of age and ability, but I'm thinking uh, elementary school kids and maybe at max um, a, a grade eights, nines, tens, but you know what? Um, uh, mountain biking is, is a skill, it requires a certain amount of skill and balance. And if you're new to the sport, whether you're nine, or 39 or 59, you need to develop those skills before you can go on to even green level um, uh, and blue level uh, trails, let's say in somebody somewhere like the North Shore or Alice Lake or Whistler. Um, pump tracks and bike skills park are, are almost like, um, like a gym, uh, an outdoor gym for mountain bikers. Uh, something like you go to Thompson to train and then you go run a marathon or run a half marathon or, 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 or do a triathlon. The same, I would, I would see that the bike skills park are there for fun, for training, for development of skills. And then you go for that afternoon long ride or the weekend trip to the Okanagan to a uh, big bike and, and do the, 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 uh, the big adventure there. So this is something local outdoor, uh, in the natural environment that we want people to be uh, access easily and just be like, hey, I'm gonna go to the bike park, mom, okay, go, come back for dinner. All right, you know, and boom, they go for a couple hours with their buddies. Thank you. Thank you. Through, through okay. the chair, if I, uh, through, Okay, thank you. Uh, through the chair, I just wanted to add, um, you know, since COVID-19 uh, has impacted us, um, we have seen a very large increase in pedestrian activities and cycling specifically. Um, so this will be a definite addition for, uh, while it is focused for primarily a younger age group, we do expect to see a very uh, diverse cross range of, of users at this site. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, certainly we've seen, you know, for those of us who've been to Whistler and other places, you see, you know, three-year-olds and adults in the same terrain in the bike park, right? So the concern, you know, my concern would be to make sure we don't underbuild it thinking that we're building it for three-year-olds when the three-year-olds will go in a similar space. And I guess um, we'll be looking at the materials and taking into consideration what the neighbors want because certainly if you go to the Garden City one, when the wind picks up and blows all that dust into the neighbor's house and into his backyard, um, you can imagine that that's not awesome for him. Luckily, I think for this location, a, a dirt pump track will probably work because it'll only blow the dirt down the road. It's not going to actually blow into anybody's yard. But um, certainly paying attention to maybe doing, including in this um, just information and questioning is the people in the radius, 100, 200 meters around it, to see if they have some comments or concerns around materials. The one thing, if it's, if it's concrete, it's noisy because everyone's going to be on skateboards. But if it's dirt and it's blowing dirt into their yards, they might not be super excited about that. 
Um, can we also get the Garden City pump track fixed? Because it, does, it has that conflict point in it where it X's and so when that group comes in and starts working on it, can they fix the Garden City track? Uh, through the chair, um, I, I'm going to have to defer to uh, my uh, Todd on that one. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with, with the issue that you uh, have identified, but we'll definitely... It's, it's, it's a figure eight track, essentially, like it's figure eights, and so there's a conflict point where kids are basically crashing it, it's smashing atoms. It's, it's basically a massive design flaw in it. So if you've oh, ever okay. been there, if you've ever been there where there's more than three kids trying to ride it, it's a disaster. <laughs> All right, we, we, we tend to uh, shy away from disasters in our park, so we'll definitely look at that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in regular contact with Hoops, um, okay. so we'll bring that to their attention for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what we're looking for, I think, here is some relationship with the schools to get some information from the kids. So I don't know if the if school board wants to maybe work with staff a little bit on, on letting kids know that there's an opportunity for for some um, input into what this program is going to be. Yeah, no, definitely. I think we'd like to have some input, and, and uh, we can talk to our staff about getting some feedback from the from the kids. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Motion to receive. Ken, second. I'm sure someone's seconding it. Their hand is up, but you can't see them. Second, Sandra. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And last item on our open agenda is the update on the 2020 school opening. Right. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, happy to provide this uh, hopefully relatively brief update. Uh, so I think it's safe to say this has definitely been the most challenging school year startup that I have encountered in 28 years. Uh, but all things considered, and given the amount of change that's occurred uh, over the 10 days before school started, I think we're off to a, a really good start. Kids are back at school, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, we're currently running three program options. The first is face-to-face -face programming, and that's for K-12 students. Also offering what we're calling remote transitional learning, and that's for students uh, kindergarten through grade 9, and then our usual distributed learning program for uh, kids in grade 10 to 12. Face-to-face uh, -face programming, we're three and a half weeks in, and uh, schools actually seem to be settling into a pretty smooth routine overall already. Uh, given the amount of change that had to occur, uh, I'm actually very pleasantly surprised, and I think it's due to uh, the hard work on the part of our, our school-based staff and also the, the patience of the parents across the community. So really happy to see that. Um, about two-thirds of our elementary kids are attending face-to-face -face at this point, and then just under 95% of secondary kids are attending face-to-face. -face. Um, the remote transitional program, so this was developed in response to uh, concerns that were expressed by some parents about sending their children back to school in September. Uh, also, understandably, not wanting to lose their child's spot in their current placement. So, Initially, it wasn't possible to accommodate that because of some fairly restrictive uh, provincial government funding policies and also the amount of extra staffing that we knew offering this program would require. Um, at the very last minute at the end of August, though, a couple things happened that allowed districts to create a transitional program. Um, the first was that the provincial government changed its funding policy to allow us to claim funding for students uh, who are not yet attending school face to face but uh, had every intention of, of in, uh, returning to face-to-face uh, -face learning. So this allowed us to hold spots for these students in their current program, uh, even if they weren't currently in attendance. The second thing that happened was the federal government provided a large amount of funding to the provinces for the education restart, and, and that allowed us to hire a, a fairly significant, a significant number of additional teachers. Uh, it wasn't enough to cover all the staffing that we needed, uh, so we also ended up redeploying our, around 30 of our teacher consultants who normally work at the district level, and they're now also supporting the remote program. Um, so two and a half weeks into the remote program, we are just over 30% of our K-7 to kids participating in that program, so that's a little under 3,800 students. Uh, of note is the fact that we have the highest percentage in the province uh, of students in uh, elementary transitional programming. And that has provided some unique challenges, I have to say, both from a staffing and a programming point of view. Uh, but we, uh, we believe we've worked out the majority of the bugs of the program and things seem to be running uh, relatively smoothly. 
Uh, we did make some adjustments to the program about 10 days ago to accommodate the large number of students uh, participating. We ended up adding large group webinars in several core subject areas so that schools, uh, students from different schools could sign up and watch the same lesson online. Uh, we ended up with a very large number, uh, over 500 students wanting to simultaneously attend some of the webinars. And unfortunately, at the time, the software license that the province had provided only allowed us to admit up to 500 kids at a time. So we've rectified the issue uh, by going back to the province and asking for an extension on our license to double the number of attendees to 1,000. And that so far seems to have addressed that problem. Um, we become aware that parents from our district, some parents from our district, are sharing the links to the webinars uh, with parents from other school districts. And this has the potential to cause the same issue if our numbers continue to grow up above 1,000. So we're working on a solution for that. Uh, I think it's a good problem to have that other districts want our programs, but we are uh, already absolutely stretched to accommodate all the extra programming we're offering to our own kids uh, and families. So we, we really can't afford to be supporting parents and students from other districts as well. Uh, you know, I think these kind of growing pains are to be expected in a program this large that was developed in a very short period of time, but things seem to have uh, settled in nicely. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the expectation of government is that students in transitional programs will return to face-to-face -face learning uh, and our program is structured accordingly. Um, most school districts' transitional programs end uh, either in November or December. We decided to go to the end of January uh, for any parents whose children have not yet moved back into face-to-face -face learning. Uh, we have three dates for parents to formally have their child return to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, upcoming, just after Thanksgiving weekend, October 13th, and then again in mid-November, and then again at the end of January. Um, what we are seeing is that in a number of schools, uh, parents are already asking if their child can return to face-to-face. -to -face. So we've tried to accommodate that where possible uh, when it wasn't going to uh, disrupt the cohort. Uh, otherwise, parents need to wait until the first official intake uh, date in a week or so. So overall, uh, very pleased to see so many kids in school uh, after being out for six months and uh, returning to their, their uh, classroom placements and seeing their teachers and friends. Uh, just one quick follow up before I finish here. Health and safety, uh, we've hired, uh, the board has hired an additional 45 FTE and school based custodial staff. So uh, we are either meeting or exceeding provincial cleaning protocols at all sites. The great majority of our students and staff continue to wear masks. And when I've uh, spoken to my colleagues uh, in other school districts, I think it's safe to say that we have a far greater proportion of people wearing masks at school. Um, frequent hand washing, sanitizing has obviously become a, a daily part of routines in schools. And we're also very grateful that parents and staff are treating the daily health declaration process so seriously. Uh, people who have symptoms are staying at home uh, and doing what they can to keep others healthy. Occasionally, uh, a student may show up at school with some symptoms and the school are working, uh, schools are working closely with the parents in those situations to uh, respond appropriately. Um, so the goal now is to start to shift the focus from being so COVID focused as a district to uh, a new normal way of teaching and learning within the context of the pandemic. So uh, over the next while, we'll be turning our attention to other items uh, in addition to uh, making sure that our schools continue to be safe. Uh, that concludes my report, Chairperson. Uh, happy to try to respond to any questions. Do we have any questions? No. Okay, um, I'll just make a comment. I've, my kids have gone back to school. They went back in June, they're back now. Um, we've, we've been really pleased with how, um, how much co communication we've received with the protocols. The kids seem to be very happy. The other parents anecdotally seem to be very happy. Um, we were really impressed with the ability for the school board to pivot with that transitional learning to hold the spot. I think that was causing a lot of stress and concern for people. Um, the one anecdotal thing I have heard is the concern around that the grade eights and nines have to attend school and they were wishing that there was a transitional program for them as well. But um, for the most part, I think I, I, everyone that's gone back to school has been pleased with, with how it's man been managed. Thank you, Chairperson, for that comment. And just as a clarification, in the end, we were able to offer a transitional program for the students in grade eight and nine. Uh, relatively okay, small you. number, yeah, relatively small number of parents uh, chose that option about uh, around 400 students we've got at this stage in that, but we were able to at the very last second pivot to be able to do that. So thank you for the feedback, but much appreciated. Well, well thank you for that. And because it is just, that was the one concern I did here in the process. Thank you.
Okay, uh, motion to receive. Ken? Second? Okay. Thank you. Sandra? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, uh, so here's our opportunity to come up with any future agenda items or any standing items that we want to have for next time. So we did hear we were going to get an update on, an, another update on the foundry as that came up. Um, anything else that we think should be on next? the next school board meeting. Okay. All right. Um, and then the next committee meeting date is on September 2nd, 2020 at 9.15 here in the Anderson room. And so does that still work for everybody? Yes. Okay. So see you then. And let's 